Well, I'd like to thank uh, Canadians for a safe technology to for giving me the opportunity of uh, addressing you today and explaining to you why I draw on the conclusion, which is the title of my talk. Because as you heard from Dr. Davis uh, just a few moments ago, uh, the International Agency for Research on Cancer uh, concluded that it was a possible human carcinogen. There's quite a difference, although very many toxic substances which we wouldn't wish to expose ourselves to uh, are 2B, but a lot are also 2A. Of course, things like asbestos, uh, where there's sufficient evidence of human carcinogenicity, we know about and we try to ban. I won't go into Canada's role in this, but that's, that's a bit difficult to tolerate sometimes. Anyway, let's move on. I thought I'd explain a little bit about the process that IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer in Lyon, um, which is a World Health Organization specialized agency, which Canada, among many other countries, support, uh, what the process is to develop what they call monographs on carcinogenicity. Well, they first take a decision to assess the carcinogenicity of an exposure, a substance, complex mixture, or whatever. And then they perform a literature review. They ex select experts from, as a result of that literature review and a number of consultations. And these experts are assigned specific tasks uh, where they have to review the publications in their area of interest, make sure they, the, the, what IARC had done before was complete, add additional uh, substances, uh, additional references, and uh, then uh, they take about three or four months to produce this, get drafts together, then they're brought together for these experts for an eight-day intensive set of discussions, and these are intensive. You turn up uh, on the Monday or Sunday if you want to rest from your transatlantic flight. You start on the Tuesday, you go through to include the Saturday. You're given the Sunday off, but usually there's so much to do that you work on the Sunday as well, and then you try and bring everything together on the Monday and Tuesday and it, it takes a lot out of you, I can tell you. And then as a result of that, that group of experts take the decision as to whether this is a human, sufficient evidence for human carcinogen, which is level one, or probable, which is 2A, possible, 2B, three, inadequate evidence, or four, sufficient evidence there is lack of carcinogenicity. Now the IARC review for monograph 102, which is what was published on uh, radio frequency fields, was in fact not a unanimous decision on 2B. Uh, in fact, there were a number of people who were present in that meeting who felt it should be 2A, but the majority vote was 2B. Now, what did, sort of data did they use? Perhaps one of the most important was what is called an interphone study. This was a multi-country study. It was case control. In other words, the investigators found selected cases of brain cancer, and controls from various mechanisms, preferably controls that would be regarded as representative of the population from which the cases were drawn. That's the ideal case control study. I was actually on the scientific council of IARC when the decision was taken to initiate the interphone study. And we had many 
disagreements as to whether this was the right time to do it. Because as Dr. Davis pointed out, and I'm going to come back to, we know it takes a very long time for sufficient evidence to accrue on cancer-causing substances. Cancer has a long natural history. And many of us at that time felt Interphone should not start at the time it did, but the majority uh, did take that decision. So this was multi-country with different uh, experiences. Canada was part of this, uh, as was the UK and many, many other countries. It was coordinated from IARC uh, by actually a Canadian scientist working there, Dr. Elizabeth Cardis. She no longer works at IARC, she now works in Spain, but she's still very involved in this issue. The other set of studies that were informative were conducted by Dr. Lennart Hardell from Sweden. And one of the characteristics of the Nordic countries, and perhaps particularly Sweden, is that you get very, very strong collaboration. I was once at a meeting uh, in a Nordic country in Sweden, and the speaker said, I want to demonstrate something to you. He said, please stand up. And the room stood up. By that I mean everybody in the room. <laughs> if you did that in other places, probably also in Canada, I think if I asked you now to stand up, many of you would say, whatever you want, you want me to stand up for, please explain that, then I'll consider whether I should stand up. But in the Nordic countries, and particularly Sweden, you get good collaboration. So Hardell was able to get good collaboration from the people from which he needed to collect data. And uh, I think this is one of the reasons why his studies have stood out. Then there was a Danish cohort study. Now, the Danes are very good at doing these studies. A cohort study means you identify a group of people, you identify what they've been exposed to, and you follow them for a long time. And they've got good records in Denmark, as they have in most Nordic countries, to do this. So Danish cohort studies are meant to be excellent. But in fact, as I shall say, explain to you in a minute, there was a problem with this study. Then the other sort of data which are considered in these reviews are what are called mechanistic data. How does something work? Do we know whether it does what it is purported to do? And we've heard quite a bit of this mechanistic data from Dr. Davis and also uh, some from uh, Magda Havis this morning. And then there are animal studies. But animal studies can be difficult. There are some animal studies which show uh, the effects of cell phones, radio frequency, radiation on cancer, not as many as one might like. Now, when you have epidemiology studies, and this is what you want uh, to be able to assess cancer in humans, you have to consider whether they are all of adequate quality. Part of the problem with case control studies is you can have biases. So the experts would have had to consider, was there a bias in relation to this study? Well, for Interphone, there was, in fact, a bias in that they didn't collect information on the um, use, the, the phones using these devices. I've blocked on the name. Um, what? Cordless phones, stupid of me. You see, this has a cord on it, actually, but that's power. <laughs> and also, there was quite a bit of confusion as to the types of data they collected, because the questionnaires were developed, and if, although they tried to make them uniform in, in different ways. So that when you actually looked at the uh, results of the Interphone study as a whole, there was absolutely no increase in risk of brain cancer. And that caused a lot of discussion. Was this because of bias, or was there a different issue which should be taken into consideration? 
Cohort studies are meant to be excellent in regard to determining etiology. But I remember very much, I uh, very well, a meeting in IARC in which we were looking at whether fruits and vegetables were protective for cancer. And it turned out that most of the cohort studies were uninformative because there was misclassification of exposure. If you ask people about diet, they tell you what they're eating now. They don't necessarily give you the information on one, what you were eating at the time when the diet was important to prevent cancer. And the Danish cohort study was particularly affected by misclassification, not just cordless phones, but they had collected information on subscribers, but they didn't identify the people who were using cell phones as a res on an individual basis as a result of a subscription of their firm to pay for the cell phones they used. So a lot of people who were using increasingly cell phones as part of their work were not categorized as a cell phone user. So there was major misclassification of the exposure. And when you get misclassification like that, you tend to get an answer that indicates no increased risk. Then we would like to have replication of studies and we would like consistency in the evidence. And at the time this review was done, there wasn't as much consistency as people would have liked. Now, one of the components of the Interphone study, surprisingly, was not put in the major report. It was in an appendix. And what this did was to characterize people who were using cell phones in terms of the time since they started regular use. And they used the group who had only started using cell phones recently. They had used it for one to two years as what we call the referent group. And they related the risk of brain cancer in those who used cell phones more, had used them for a longer duration, two to four years, five to nine years, or 10 or more years, to that referent group. And what you can see here is increasing risk with increasing duration of use of, of cell phones. And you've got a, more than doubling of the risk of brain cancer of those who'd use cell phones for 10 or more years. Now that's what's called a dose-response analysis. We look for dose-response in nearly all the epidemiology studies we carry out for cancer causation. And that, to my mind, is extremely important and should not have been relegated to an appendix and should have been given more weight. I'm not going to review uh, the other studies in detail. Just let us recognize that that working group, those particular group of experts, a different group of experts might have taken, drawn a different conclusion, decided that Radio frequency fields, as used in cell phones, and of course elsewhere, were a possible human carcinogen. Now what has happened since then? There's been an occupational study uh, by Elizabeth Cardis, which has shown, interestingly, that people exposed to radio frequency fields fairly recently have got an increased risk of brain cancer. And that they suggest that this may indicate that cell phone radio frequency fields may act at the what could we call the later stages of carcinogenesis to accelerate the process in people who are already susceptible. That's something that hasn't been considered as yet, but it is important. There have been new Hardell studies, one of them is in your folder indicating, as had shown before, increased risk. And perhaps more, most interestingly, there has been a new French study, uh, which is called Serenet. 
And this summarizes this French study. It, they characterized the exposure for glioma, malignant brain cancers, in terms of the exposure period. Exposure after two years, after three years, after five years, and there's increasing risk. There's actually diminished numbers uh, after five years, but it shows a significantly increased risk, fivefold increased risk in that particular group. They also looked at the risk for uh, brain cancers on the same side where people hold their phones compared to the other side, and there's a doubling of risk. They also found increased risk for meningioma. So with these additional studies, and again, you find this in your folder, uh, Dr. Davis, I and other scientists concluded that radiofrequency fields should be regarded as a probable human carcinogen, just, not just a possible, and taken much more seriously than people have done up till now. I am indebted to Dr. Davis for this and some slides that are going to follow. They are much more picturesque than my own, as you will see. Uh, but essentially, what this demonstrated is that there is a lag period from the time of an intense exposure to the increased risk of brain tumors in terms of the atomic study uh, in Japan. Uh, when I was introduced, uh, the, uh, you were told about my initial experience with lung cancer. Uh, and uh, a patient treated as a newly qualified physician with lung cancer. That particular experience and some later experience treating women with metastatic breast cancer had uh, major impacts on me. And a lot of my work has been concerned with both lung and brain cancer. But one of the things you may or may not know is that possibly the most informative study of tobacco and health, the British doctor study, initiated by Sir Richard Dahl uh, many, many years ago, about possibly 10 years ago, maybe slightly more recently, they produced the 40-year follow-up of that study. And what this demonstrated to a much greater extent than people had realized, the hazard of heavy cigarette smoking. Heavy cigarette smokers, if they continue through to their 50s or 60s, take on average 10 years off their lifespan. And uh, something like half of people develop lung cancer. A lot of people, uh, women, turned out also develop breast cancer is a lot of cigarette smoking, but this is another topic. So although in most epidemiological studies, cell phones do not increase breast cancer, this is uh, until about 10 years of use, although I showed you some recent data which suggests you may see it more recently. Now, there are some additional studies underway, thank goodness. There is a COSMOS cohort study in five European countries. This could be informative. I don't know enough about it to know whether their exposure is good, but there have been calls that this should be repeated in the uh, uh, United States, and some of us think we should do it in Canada. In fact, uh, we do have a large cohort study in Canada. It's called the Tomorrow Project of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. Within Ontario, it's the Ontario Health Study. Uh, that the Ontario Health Study has just got a new director. I happen to know him. He's a Canadian, but he's worked in the NCI. I intend to talk to him about in reintroducing into that study exposure measurements that would be relevant to assess the effect of radio frequency fields. Some of us tried to get these in earlier and the previous director wasn't interested. There's a case control study in multiple countries called Moby Kids. It involves several centers in Canada, 
Some people are a bit anxious about the direction of that study, uh, but uh, I and uh, Deborah, I don't know where Deborah is, but she's not here. There she is. Uh, met the, uh, um, the, the leader of that study, Dan Kruski, in Toronto a few months ago. And uh, although I think Deborah was a little worried, uh, I was reassured by what I heard that this is probably being conducted well. You can't expect a, a study like Interphone to be followed up. It, I doubt very much whether there'll be much coming out of it anymore because the data are all collected. But we do need more studies. And as I've just told you, there is a possibility that uh, this will be done in the future in this province. Now, and again, I'm indebted to uh, Dr. Davis for these slides. It's something I knew about, but I hadn't seen all, all the data that she used. There is now a suspicion that radio frequency fields will increase the risk, not just of brain cancer, but many other cancers. Um, I'll show you one shortly. But also breast cancer. And there have been some unusual clinical case reports. Now, one doesn't often use case reports to assess the carcinogenicity of a substance. But quite often, an alert physician has identified a potential cancer-causing risk that has led to people investigating this in detail. This happened for an unusual tumor of the liver in workers with vinyl chloride. It actually led to a change in the way vinyl chloride was produced so that humans were not exposed at all. The production process was completely enclosed. Uh, we can't completely enclose radio frequency fields, but we can certainly avoid some types of exposure. We can also learn quite a bit from modeling. And as we've already heard this morning, we can use toxicology. And it turns out that there have been some people who have been marketing gear for helping women to put cell phones in their bras. This is not something that a man normally thinks very much about. But it, 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 it can happen. Here's another cancer where things have been changing. In Israel, where mobile telecommunications are the norm and have been used longer than most other nations, one in every f uh, five victims of salivary gland parotid tumors are under the age of 20, which suggests that cell phone use in young people is increasing a rare type of cancer. And this just indicates the increase in the, in the rate of these tumors. And the, there was an Israeli case control study they found an association between tumors and cell phone use based on the largest number of benign that is, parotid gland tumors patients reported to date. Our results suggest an association between cell phone use and parotid gland tumors. So the authors recommended that people often do continued research, but it led to a warning that one young people should use headsets and speaker phones uh, to limit exposure to their head to microwave radiation. This is a picture back to breast cancer of the way a model used a cell phone. There have now been seven premenopausal women reported with breast cancers 
that were located where the cell phones were stored. One of these, the first case report in 2009, there was invasive multiple primary tumours in a 34-year-old who used the cell phone uh, in a place where you could get contact. So if you place a cell phone so that it emanates and comes on, in on top of the tumours, that would be a good thing. And now seven case reports. Two cases are age 21 with multifocal tumours. So if any of you are used to looking at these, and several of us look at these sort of images from time to time, you can see the multifocal tumours. And this image is a bit difficult to see. Again, multifocal tumours tied with cell phones kept in the bra. And a physician reported the type of, of cancer that you see here. So to summarise these seven cases, they weren't women who were carriers of the breast cancer susceptibility genes, BRCA1 or 2. They weren't women who had a family history or extensive other risk factors. There were women who, where the cancers occurred in an unusual location. They were multifocal and they were essentially where the phones had been kept. But there was no significant histology in ducts or lobular units away from the breast in the areas the cellular phone was not used. Two of these women developed metastases. So this is a critical issue that we've got to consider how we're going to evaluate and uh, Dr. Davis and I are going to discuss this um, later on this afternoon. So in summary, for breast cancer, we have exposure information, we have in vitro toxicology of various sorts, and we can conclude that radiofrequency fields is probably a cause of breast cancer, an unusual form of breast cancer in young women. So we've got to try and prevent this occurring in other women. So my overall conclusion is that radio frequency fields are a probable human carcinogen, and this is IARP category 2A. As we've been hearing all today, radio frequency fields are ubiquitous. We've got to remember that even if the risk per individual is low, which will in fact make it very difficult to identify uh, causes, but because the exposure is widely distributed, there could be major public health issues over this wide distribution, which is why I found myself in the last few months involved in discussions on cell towers and various other exposures. So we must use what we call the precautionary principle. For radiation, we learned years ago, for ionizing radiation, x-rays, the principle as low as reasonably achievable, ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable. We should apply this principle to this sort of exposure. We should take, we should not be putting Wi-Fi in schools, we should be using lines directly to our computers, not Wi-Fi, and we should hold our phones away. My own wife, we learned years ago, had chemical hypersensitivity. Only a matter of six months ago, just before we went off for our sailing holiday, it suddenly occurred to us that she was suffering symptoms because of the cordless phone that was in the kitchen. 
and took it out, replaced it. It was difficult to find, actually, an old <laughs> wired phone, but we found it. And uh, uh, the symptoms cleared up. So we all have to be careful about the sorts of exposures we encounter, and we have to reduce them as minimal as possible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anthony. If you could please stay for a moment in case there are questions. Um, that was very informative and from somebody who is truly at the very top of his field internationally um, and one of them who, who did re worked as a reviewer on the Class 2B classification and determination. One of the things that I wanted to point out is when it, how conservative this group of speakers are. And when they say something, believe me, it is true 10 times over before they dare to say it. And for him to say that this is most likely a probable carcinogen, it is most likely. One of the things that we need to point out here is I worked as a journalist for years, so I have a particular interest in how this message gets out. About three weeks before the IARC group met in 2011, it was exposed by a French journalist that the, the head, the chair of the panel, had a direct conflict of interest to the wireless industry. And that chair was dismissed and replaced. No, no, no. Is that not accurate? No, that's not so. Not, not for IARC, no. He was a chair of a sub-panel, but not It was a chair of a sub-panel. There was a conflict, there was a conflict the, exposed. Deborah's right. It was um, a, um, someone who, who was going to be head of the subgroup yes. of epidemiologists. There was another... And, it, and uh, he, he actually wasn't dismissed. He voluntarily left. He, he was annoyed. Yes. He was furious, but he did leave. There was another conflict in Canada with the Royal Society of Canada's recent review, where, again, it was a journalist for the Canadian Medical Association Journal that exposed a conflict of interest. And what I'm getting at here is not that there's conflicts running through your profession, but rather... These conflicts exist entirely throughout science because yeah, people work for different people. What vigilance is being applied, or could we expect to be applied if the IARC meets again to look at the, the Class 2A possibility? Well, IARC, um, WHO in general, and IARC uh, also have spent some time looking at their documentation of potential conflicts of interest. Um, the, there is a uh, an up-to-date form which anyone who participates in any of these working groups has to sign. And there are various circumstances under which you can or cannot participate in these groups. If it, there's an obvious direct financial interest to you or a member of your family, you will not be able to participate as a member of the working group. If you have had industry funding in relation to something which is going to be considered, then you have to declare that. And the a decision will be taken by the director of IARC and the chairman of the working group, the whole, of the whole working group, as to whether you should participate in any voting uh, which goes on over a particular issue. In relation. So they have tightened things up. Um, let me just make a comment to somebody, just in case this were to come up for me. You know, some of you know that I did uh, the invitation of Ontario Hydro, a study of electrical and magnetic fields. Um, and we did this, in fact, in Ontario Hydro workers, and we subsequently did a case control study of childhood leukemia with a cl collaboration the Hospital for Sick Children in the Toronto area, we found an increased risk of, of exposure to magnetic fields for childhood leukemia. And uh, we found increased risk of, uh, of leukemia and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in Ontario hydro workers who entered high electrical fields. This was funded by Ontario Hydro. Um, but it was not paid to me in any way. It came to the university. The funds came to the university. They were managed by the university. We got no personal profit. So I do believe it is sometimes possible. You know, it, it, 
Industry increasingly is being asked to collaborate with universities to do research. Uh, it is, in my view, possible to introduce safeguards. So I just want to defend academics. And when um, uh, Deborah and I met with Dan Kruski, who is head of the Canadian component of the Moby Kids study, I did go through with him the way this was being funded, because it is being funded uh, in part by the telecommunications industry, um, and how the monies were coming, coming in. And it seemed to me there were safeguards. But you're right, we've got to look into this very carefully. Does anyone else have questions for Dr. Miller? Or comments that you may have? Dorothy. Thank you for your presentation, Tony. Um, Dorothy, also from the University of Toronto. Right? Thank you. Dorothy Golden Rosenberg. I teach about environmental and ecosystem health um, to largely health professionals at the University of Toronto. Um, with regard to your, your study with Ontario Hydro, I'm particularly interested. How did you differentiate, differentiate between exposures to ionizing radiation, which is rife in the nuclear industry, as you know, and electromagnetic radiation with regard to producing cancers and leukemias? Well, w w what we were able to get from Ontario Hydro was a detailed job history. And uh, the people who were working in the, um, uh, with ionizing radiation were identified as such because these people uh, had to wear uh, monitors, badges to monitor. So they were, they were specifically identified. So we could, in fact, exclude them. What we did with the collaboration of the of excellent physicists who were then working for Ontario Hydro, uh, particularly Dr. David Agnew, um, we were able to develop what is called a job exposure matrix. We had lists of all the jobs individuals worked, the places where they worked, and David Agnew and his colleagues worked out by measurements with devices the extent to which working in this particular job in that particular place would have, would have resulted in exposure to electric or magnetic fields. So it was possible, it was complicated, but it was possible to develop um, a, uh, if you like, an inventory of the extent to which people were exposed to electrical or magnetic fields, and we were able to exclude those who were exposed to uh, ionizing radiation. So you didn't consider a combination of the exposures with each other? No, we didn't. I d there obviously are people who are exposed to both. Uh, we didn't look at that specifically. Um, it would be worth doing, I do agree. As it happens, I've tried quite hard uh, in the last few years to see if we could go back and update that study, and nobody in the successes to either the two corporations seeded Ontario Hydro have agreed to the proposal. I haven't yet finished. We may do it. Hi, my name is Catherine Yash. I'm a naturopathic doctor. I was just curious, in the presentation you said um, there was no increased rate of brain tumors until after 10 years of uh, heavy use with cell phones. What, what's defined as heavy use? Well, what we did, I mean, as I showed you, the, the characterization in the studies was of, usually of duration. Um, at regular uses for 10 years or more of the people who's got the increased risk. But it, it, you're perfectly correct. We should be working at getting better measures of exposure. And one of the things that uh, uh, if we were able to incorporate the... Um, radio frequency field exposure in the Ontario Hydro, uh, sorry, Ontario Health Study, um, I would try and do, or try and get people to do, to see the extent we could actually link individuals' records of cell phone use 
to these data. I mean, this is possible. It would require people's consent to that. Um, but I don't see why that shouldn't be possible in this day and age. Thank you. Let me just follow up on that, uh, Tony. There was an effort in the United States in 1996 by Ken Rothman to establish a collaboration with the uh, cell phone industry to get billing records. And uh, I think that that's something, again, that we might put on Mr. Young's plate, uh, because um, it seems that the cell phone uh, industry has successfully said we can't give that information out. Uh, and, and they may, in fact, be deliberately not gathering it, you understand. Um, so it, obviously, it's public health data. They say in the United States that they throw the records away after three years. But we know that nowadays in the world of digital data, there's no throwing anything away. Uh, and it, it really is vitally important for public health purposes that we get this information. Our colleague Mary Redmayne in New Zealand has just done a study that I can't show you the data, but we discussed it yesterday. I want to share with the group here, where she showed that a survey of parents about their children's use of cell phone underestimated with the children report by a factor of two. So the eight, nine, and 10-year-olds, the parents said that 10 or 20 percent of them were using a cell phone every day, but the children themselves uh, said that it was 40 to 60 yeah, percent yeah. because they borrow somebody's phone and the parent yeah, doesn't even yeah. know it. And we need to get more information because we're basically flying blind without this. And given how important the exposures are, I think it may take a member's bill or something of that sort yeah. to release this information. And the same thing with Ontario Hydro. I know very well that study you did in the, was it the 80s, right? 1985, yeah. I think. Um, obviously must be followed up. And by now, even though the industry is even more highly mechanized, Dorothy's point about the synergy between ionizing and non-ionizing radiation is a very important one. Yeah. Again, public health research requires access to data, which we are being denied right now. Right. I just make a point about access. I mean, what, what we've been saying is, reinforces what I said earlier. That you, we need to get away from misclassification. So the greater we are able to refine exposures, the better. But I, I'd just like to give you an anecdote. Um, after I um, retired, uh, so-called, um, <laughs> I, I spent a year in um, Annapolis on my boat, but I worked in the National Cancer Institute. Then I went to IOC for two years. Then I went to the German Cancer Research Center. And uh, German Cancer Research Center, I was there for four years. And they were terribly anxious about data protection. So people said, you can't do good studies in Germany in good epidemiology. Absolutely wrong, because what this forced us to do was to do studies with consent. We achieved consent from people. We had 25,000 people who we had collected dietary records. We did studies on breast cancer. We did all sorts of studies with their consent. And if you get people's consent to, rec to records, to linking records, you can do it. And this is one of the things about the Ontario Health Study. How many people in this room are participants in the Ontario Health Study? You all should be. Enroll. You get, contribute to collecting information on exposures. It's consent. And one of the wonderful things about this study is that it, it is des designed in such a way that the data that is provided with your consent can be linked to OHIP records, which are in the hands of the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, ISIS, which is based in uh, near Sunnybrook, um, and where linkages are made with absolute confidentiality and a great deal of information is being collected. So research is actually, into this issue, is one of our obligations. Uh, and we should encourage people to participate in research. I'm sorry, I'm going on. Magda. 
In, in the, for the person who asked about what is considered heavy use, in the Interphone study, heavy use at that time was considered half an hour a day. So that was considered heavy use that was linked to brain tumors. Thank you. A um, couple <coughs> quick questions. I wasn't, on the Moby Kids study, you had talked about conflicts of interest or industry sponsorship. Are you saying it can be kosher to have industry sponsorship? What, or how do industry you, how do you sponsorship, think? I think, is going to be inevitable in many aspects of research. Uh, industry sponsorship is occurring in that study. Um, and uh, undoubtedly, the industry hopes that uh, there won't be a, uh, a positive finding. Now, in my view, providing the sponsorship is provided through the university with safeguards, as was done in my case by the University of Toronto, I don't see any harm in it. But you need the safeguards. You may, may absolutely certain you get the safeguards. Right. Hi, Frank Clegg from C4ST. I just want to comment that you can have industry sponsorship, and Anthony, I think uh, the first part of it is to have it, it funneled through an independent organization. I, I would su submit the second major step is to have a, the commitment from industry for multi-year. Okay. Uh, so say if you're, if you are in industry and you're serious about it, make a commitment for 20 years, so then therefore there isn't any pressure on the, on the surveyors to, or the, uh, the researchers to come back with, a, quote, the right answer. I don't know if you'd agree with that, that approach. Oh, I do agree with that, absolutely. The idea that there are pressures on researchers to come up with right answers is, is to me, anathema. But I, there are instances where this has occurred, and uh, it's, it's regretful. Um, I'm uh, associate editor for epidemiology for the International Journal of Cancer. We do a, a blacklist of people who, for various reasons, uh, we won't take their papers anymore. And this is essentially what I think a lot of editors have had to do of journals to uh, make sure that people who do behave inappropriately are identified and their work is not continued to be supported. We have one more comment or question from the floor. I was just curious, uh, Carol Mualam, family doctor. Uh, curious about who in the government is responsible for setting the standards and who, is it Health Canada here, is it the FDA, is it, um, I'm, I'm a little unclear. <laughs> it's, well, I, I may need to be corrected, but I, in my understanding it's Health Canada in Canada who set these standards. And uh, I don't know whether we can discuss Safety Code 6 this afternoon, but... Uh, I believe Frank will be talking okay. quite so a bit we're, about we're, the regulatory, that intersection between the science and the public policy. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Thank you. Well, thank you all for your interest. Thank you very much. <laughs>